Chapter 2, Configuring a Network Operating System. This week's lecture, I'm going to use the ebook that is available to you through NetSpace to go through this lecture. There are a few items I would like to point out. First, upon completion of this chapter, you'll be able to explain the purpose of Cisco IOS. You'll be able to explain how to access and navigate the Cisco IOS to configure network devices. You should be able to describe the command structure of the Cisco IOS software. You'll be able to configure the host name of a Cisco IOS device using the command line interface. That's what CLI stands for. You will use Cisco IOS commands to limit access to device configurations. Use Cisco IOS commands to save the running configuration because after you've done all that work, you want to save it so that it's not lost. You should be able to explain how devices communicate across network media. You should be able to configure a host device with an IP address. That kind of gives it its house number. Basically, it tells it exactly where it lives. And verify connectivity between two end devices. With your home, you may have a home network set up. And if you do, typically you'll have a TV, possibly, if you have a smart TV. You have your PCs, your laptops, maybe your tablets. Uh, maybe you have a digital living network alliance where your home thermostat and your garage door and your lights are all connected. Do you game? Do you have your Xbox or your PlayStation connected to your network? All of these are end devices. And these end devices are usually connected to your home's router. And the home's router are actually four devices all wrapped into one typically. What you have is your router. And a router forwards data packets to and receives data packets from the internet. You have your switch. It connects in devices using network cables. You have your wireless access point. That consists of a radio transmitter that's capable of connecting in devices wirelessly. And then you have your firewall appliance and that secures your outgoing traffic and restricts incoming traffic. Now in businesses, you have this on a larger scale and these different devices are standalone devices. Your router is separate from your switch and your switch is typically separate from your wireless access points and all are separate from your firewall appliance. Each device is very different in hardware use and capability but in all cases it is the operating system that enables the hardware to function. It's what tells it what to do and how to do it. The Cisco Internetwork Operating System, or IOS, is a generic term for the collection of network operating systems used on the Cisco networking devices. And Cisco IOS is used for most Cisco devices regardless of the type or size of the device. So if you're using a Cisco device in your home, the IOS will work the same the same or very similar to the Cisco device you have in a workplace. And in this chapter, we're going to go over some basic network topology or how things are laid out. And it's going to consist of two switches and two PCs to demonstrate how to use the Cisco IOS. And basically, your IOS is just an operating system, like on your PC. You can go through this particular activity if you like. It is set up to design a set of commands used by this voice activated control system to identify how they're going to be executed. The functions in this particular demonstration is how a car works. How do you turn on the lights, the wipers, the radios? You can do this activity here. You do not have to submit it and it will not be graded. But if you would like to do it and send it to me, I will look over it and let you know if you're on the right track. Now, all Cisco network devices use an operating system otherwise known as the Internetwork Operating System 
or iOS. Typically, when you go through this chapter online, the little bullet points that are set aside, you typically will see again. Just a heads up. You have the iOS Boot Camp. All-in devices, like I've said before, <coughs> and the network devices need some type of operating system to tell them how to perform, how to work. With our operating systems, we have hardware, we have the kernel, and we have the shell. And here at the shell level, if I click on it, you see we have the command line and we have the GUI or the graphical user interface. And it's the user interface that allows users to request specific tasks from the computer. And these requests can be made either through the command line interface or the graphical user interface. You have the kernel. And what the kernel does is it communicates between the hardware and the software of a computer and manages how the hardware resources are used to meet the requirements of the software. Then we have the hardware. That is the physical part of the computer, including the underlying electronics. Basically, you can think of the hardware as what part of the computer you can actually touch or that's inside the cases that you can touch. Now, some of the differences between your home network and a business network is with your home network operating system on those home routers are usually called firmware and we typically access those through a web browser. On a larger business network where you actually have a standalone router, the most common method to access those devices is through the command line and you will either get to those through the console port or you may telnet into the router itself to get to the command line. The behind the scenes functions for switches and routers are very similar to the operating system on your PC and the iOS on the switch or the router provides you the tech network technician a way to interface or work with that device. You can enter commands to configure or program the device and various networking functions and the iOS operation details vary on internet working devices depending on the purpose of that device and the features supported by that device. Not all routers are the same, not all switches are the same. It depends on what model and what level you have. The Cisco iOS is a term that encompasses a number of different operating systems that run on various networking devices. And they're very distinct variations to the Cisco iOS. The iOS for switches, routers, and other Cisco networking devices are one. Then you have the iOS is numbered version for a given Cisco networking device. What version level is it? The iOS feature sets providing distinct packages of features and services. Just like with your PC, you may be running Windows 8, or if you have a MacBook, you're running its latest operating system. And a Windows 8 functions very differently than the Windows XP. The same with the Cisco iOS, depending on what version you are running, depends on how it functions. The iOS file itself is several megabytes in size, so it's not very large and it's stored in a semi-permanent memory area called flash. This figure shows a compact flash card and the flash memory provides non-volatile storage. This means that the contents of the memory are not lost when you power off the device. If you come to campus and work in our live labs, when you're ready to work with the routers, you'll have to request the flash cards and I will give those to you. We keep those put up. Um, just so they don't tend to walk off. Flash can be used to store multiple versions of the iOS software at the same time. And many of our Cisco devices, the iOS is copied from the Flash into the RAM when the device is powered on. And then the iOS then runs in RAM and not off the Flash card. 
the quantity of flash memory and RAM memory required for a given iOS varies dramatically. And for the purpose of network maintenance and planning, it's important to determine the flash and RAM requirements for each device. You don't want to be short if you can help it. The Cisco iOS routers and switches perform functions that your network professionals depend upon to make their networks work correctly. Some of our major functions performed are enabled by the Cisco routers and switches include providing network security. We can determine who gets where through the routers and switches through our command line. The IP addressing of virtual and physical interfaces. Enabling interface specific configuration to optimize connectivity as the respective media. And we'll get more into that throughout this course and in future courses. You have routing. Which way does the information need to go most efficiently? We can enable quality of service or QoS technologies and supporting network management technologies. Each feature or service has an associated collection of configuration commands that allow a network technician to implement it. And the services provided by the Cisco IOS are generally accessed using the command line interface. You will want to take the time to watch this video. It's about a six and a half, seven minute video that goes over the Cisco connection online. And this is a video that Cisco has provided for you. Now accessing the Cisco IOS device. There are several ways to access this command line interface. The most common methods are either through the console, telnet, or the auxiliary port. When you come to campus, because you will have to come to campus to take your final skills-based exam, and I would suggest that you come to campus prior to that so that you can get used to the look and feel of our equipment. For your benefit, I will post a video um, showing our actual equipment and how we connect uh, the console cables and the different cables to our routers and switches and how to insert the flash properly so that you will at least have seen it before you come to campus to attempt it. You will have a specific type of cable that is used for your console. It's designed to uh, connect into the back of your piece of equipment, either in the back of the router or the switch, and it's typically marked with blue so that you know that is where the console cable goes and it's light blue. Our console cables are also light blue and they have the RJ45 connector on one end and then they have the uh, connector on the other end to connect to our monitor port on the back of our PC or laptop, whichever device you are using. The console ports are not typically secure by default but you can set up a secure password and able to make your network a little bit more secure. Because if you can get to the console, you can get to the command line and you can make changes to the network. You can telnet into the device and it's a method to remotely establish the command line session of the device through a virtual interface over the network. Typically it is secure and you want it to be very secure. You do not want people to be able to telnet into your location and make changes to your network. The same is true for the secure shell. And then the auxiliary is an older way to establish a command line session remotely and that's via the telephone dial-up connection. Here on campus we use PuTTY as our emulation once you get into console and you need to make sure that you have that set up properly and again I will go through and have a step-by-step -step video on exactly how to set up PuTTY for you. Here is TerraTerm in your labs it talks about using TerraTerm. If you're using NetLabs you actually only have to click on the device and it will open up the command line 
you do not have to go from the PC and use TerraTerm to get to it. You have actual access to the device itself. And then here is a secure CRT connection. Again, we do not use this connection type in class. Be sure when you're going through the online activities here and reading the book, do the activities that are available. It helps you test your information, make sure you're understanding. Uh, you can just go through here and click. I'm not actually reading these. I'm just going to show you how this looks. You can make your selections. Once you're through, you can click check and it tells you which ones you've gotten right, which ones you've gotten wrong. Then you can reset and you can choose different options. And then you can go back and check again. So this is a good way for you to learn and to test your knowledge. Once you have connected your console cable and you are now at the command line of your device, there's a few things that you need to understand. You have the user executive mode and this is illustrated here. This is showing it on a router. It says router with the greater than sign. This means that you're at the user exec mode. From here you can ping. You have limited show commands. You can enable and you can accept and do other information but it's very limited what you can do here. Next you have the privileged executive mode and you always know that you're in that mode when you see the pound sign after router. You have all the user exec commands, but now you can also debug, reload, configure, and there's uh, several other commands that you can do at this location as well. At global configuration mode, it'll tell you that you're in router config, and then you have a certain amount of commands that you can give here as well. One of the things you can do at the router config is you can give it a host name. Host names are very important. It helps you keep your routers and switches organized because you don't want all your routers names to be router. Give them specific names. The same with your switches. This is where you can enable secret and what that does is it changes your password into encrypted passwords so that when someone does show run and it shows the running configuration then it doesn't give away your password. Next we have global configuration mode and there's other specific um, configuration modes that you can get into. You'll notice here where we did an interface that we're now in config interface. Here we're in config router because we're trying to take determine which router interface are we using? Are we doing router RIP? Are we doing OSPF? How are we routing? And then the config line. Are we doing the VTY, which is the telnet lines, the console, the auxiliary? Which lines are we configuring? A little bit more about user exec mode. This is how it looks on the switch and the router. This is how it's going to look when you first putty in or console in to the router or the switch. And you have limited examination of your router or your switch. Um, it allows only a limited number of basic monitoring commands. So then we get into privileged exec mode. This is typically where you have a password set up to get to the privileged exec mode. It allows all monitoring commands as well as execution of configuration and management commands. So this is definitely where you want a password in between the user exec and the privilege because as you can see once you get into the privileged exec mode you have more control over the network. Once we're in privileged exec mode we have detailed examination of our routers or our switching we can do debugging, testing, we can manipulate it. Once we get into global configuration mode, we can make changes to our switches and our routers. We can change the IP addresses, 
we can change the routing protocol that is used. So there's a lot we can do from within the global config settings. Once we get into the switch on console zero, everything starts at zero, not one. So at switch con zero, which means you have your console cable plugged into the console port, you press return to get started. You'll see switch. In order to enable your privileged exec mode, you type in enable. If you have a pr password set up, you will see the password, then you will have to type the password in. At that point, it gives you now the privileged exec mode. To come out of the privileged exec mode, you can type disable, and it brings you back to the exec mode, or you can type exit. On the switch, it works the exact same way. Here on this example, we're going from switch, we're going to enable it. We're going to go to privileged mode with enable. And now we're going to go into global configuration. We're going to type in configure terminal. And you'll see that it now says switch config pound sign. One of the things I'd like to point out is when you're typing in commands, you can usually type in the first three letters of the command. Hit your tab key and it will fill out the rest of that word. And there are some shortcuts you can use. For this one, you can type in config T and it will do the same thing. You can click on each of these examples here and it's going to walk you through how it sets up each of these inter information. This one's setting up an interface for the VLAN. So we've created our interface VLAN and it exited back out. You do not have to exit between each one. Here's a nine minute video. This is a good example on how to navigate through the different command line modes of both a router and a switch. Again, this is a great video for you to go through. I'm not going to play it for you. You can do that on your own time. The basic iOS command structure, structure is you have the prompt, which here is the switch, and we are at the user mode, user exec mode. Then you have the command, this example we're going to ping or show. Then we have a space so that it knows that you're getting ready to tell it something else. And then we have our keyword or our argument. In this command we're going to ping the device that's located at this IP address. With this command we're going to show the IP protocols that are being used. When you look at the commands that are given in the textbook, on this book, or in the labs, if it's in boldface, the text indicates commands and keywords that you enter literally as shown. The italics indicates arguments for which you supply values. The bracket square brackets indicate an optional element. The braces, a group required choice, and a vertical bar separates the alternative elements. The braces and vertical lines within square brackets indicate a required choice within an optional element. The Cisco IOS command reference is a collection of online documentation that describes in detail the IOS commands used on Cisco devices. It's going to give you the syntax, the default, the mode, history, usage guidelines, and examples. In order to navigate there, you'll go to cisco.com, support, networking software. An example here would be the version, reference guidelines, 
So this is a great way to get the information you're needing. Another good source Another good source is the CCNA Routing and Switching Portable Command Guide, 3rd Edition. If you plan on taking NET 126, this is going to be one of the highly recommended books that you purchase for the class. You will use this particular book for the next three semesters, and then after that, once you get into the workforce, if you're going into some type of networking environment. The iOS does have several forms of help available. You have contact sensitive help. Here you can do CL. You know you're wanting to do something with the clock possibly, possibly. So do CL and a question mark and it gives you clear and clock. I can say clock set and a question mark and it's going to show me how to do that as well. And we also have hotkey. Hot key shortcuts. That is where we do the tab. Some command syntax checks. If we did clock set and hit enter, it tells you it's incomplete. If you do clock set 1950.00, it is still incomplete. And then if you just enter to C, it would tell you it was ambiguous. Have to slow down saying that word. Here's some information to help you understand what the syntax errors give you. Our hotkey shortcuts. We have tab, backspace, control D, control K, escape D. These are good to keep in mind. The ones that you'll use the most are the ones you'll memorize. Um, these are good examples of the ones you will use a good deal. I do use tab a good deal to help me complete the command lines that I'm keying in. And I use control Z a good bit. Some of your most common uh, commands that you will use that will help you troubleshoot where you're working. We have show interface and then you'll give the interface number like fast ethernet 01 or FA01 shows you the status of your internet of your interface. The show startup config displays the saved configuration that's located on NVRAM. Show running config is going to show you the commands that are currently being run. You can show your process, you can show your CDP neighbors, that's to see who's connected to you on the switch, who else can see you. So there's many different commands that you'll use to help troubleshoot and those will be pointed out as we go. Here we did show version on our router and it shows the version that we're running. It will show you the bootstrap version, the software version, the system startup time, the restart information, the router type and process information, software features and hardware features. You'll see the same thing when you switch to your switch and do show version. Next we come here we have our packet tracer. You have the same information showing up here inside the course. Navigating the iOS, that's the PKA. Here we actually have the packet, tra packet tracer instructions. You can download those and have those separate. These will actually print out for you. Here's the lab. In this particular lab, they're using TerraTerm. We do not use TerraTerm. We also do not have this lab, even though it says users on NetLabs, that you can rem use NetLabs and skip to part two. We do not have this particular lab set up in our NetLabs. However, in part two, if I can find it, part two, part 
2. It's a good example of how you can run the commands. You can show version, you can show the clock, you can enable, you've got your clock set. You can also do this within Packet Tracer. Some of the basic configurations that you're going to want to do, like I said earlier, is set up your host name. If you're working and you have three switches, how do you know which switch you're working on if you haven't named them? In the labs, it will tell you to give each switch a name and it will give you the name of the switch. If you are the network technician or designer, you will come up with the names of these switches and make them relevant to where they're located, what they're connected to, what their purpose is. The same for a router. Here's an example. We have these three switches and they've named them switch floor one, switch floor two, switch floor three. That makes it easier when you go to troubleshoot and when you're trying to configure information. So here we are at switch pound sign. So we're at the privilege mode and we want to type in and give it a new name. So we would have to do config T and it changes it to switch config T. You type in host name SW-floor-1. Word of advice, if you're working in Packet Tracer, it is case sensitive and space sensitive. If you see a space within a word or a command, make sure you do it exactly the way Packet Tracer has it laid out. There are several different levels of passwords that you're going to want to create. You can use Enable Password, and that's going to limit access to the Privileged Exec Mode. You can enable Secret, and that one will encrypt the password. We can have console passwords. That way someone can't walk up and plug into the console port and have uh, free access to your system. Then we have the VTY password, or that's the Telnet password. That way they can't Telnet into your system. It's a good idea to use passwords that are more than eight characters in length. Use a combination of upper and lower case numbers, special characters, and or numeric sequence in a password. You may want to try to avoid using the same password for all devices. And you don't want the same password for your telnet, your console, and your privileged exec mode. Avoid using common words such as a password or administrator because these are easily guessed. Also a word of warning, spaces can be used in passwords. So if you set your password up as Cisco and then hit enter, that's the password. But if you hit type in Cisco, you hit your space bar and then hit enter. Your password is actually Cisco space. So be careful with that. To secure the privileged exec mode using a encrypted password, you would use enable secret. And then our password in this example is class. So once you did show run, it would have your password and it would look like a bunch of hieroglyphics uh, because it would be encrypted. To in put a password on your console, here we're at switch config plus uh, pound side, so we're in privileged exec mode and we're doing global configurations. So we've got line console zero, or you can type in line con zero. Password, our password here is Cisco. Once you do that, then you have to key log in so that it knows that the Cisco and it's going to log in with this one. Then we hit exit to get out of this command sequence. You'll do the same thing for your telnet lines. For 
your telnet lines you're going to do on the switch, on this particular switch, it appears to have 16 ports. You'll do VTY 0 space 15. That means that it has 16 telnet ports that it can log into. Again, you can practice configuring your password here. If we set up an encrypted password, service password encryption is turned on. I can do show run and you'll see here that all my passwords are encrypted. You need to make sure that when you're setting up your switches and your routers that you have a banner message of the day. So that is banner with a space, MOTD with a space, then use a character that you're not typically going to use within your message. I typically use the pound sign or the percent sign because I'm not going to use that within the statement that I'm going to make. And then you make your statement. This is a secure system, authorized access only. Then you end it with the same character that you used. Do not put the message welcome. There have been cases where people broke into someone's network and their excuse was, well, when I logged in, it said welcome. So I assumed I was welcome and the judge went in favor of the person who broke into the network. So make sure that your network says that it is secure and that no one is allowed in. Once you've created your login and all your running configuration, you've taken the time to key all the commands in, you're going to want to save that and I would do so periodically. To do that you do copy, running config, startup config. What that does is it saves your running configuration to your startup configuration. In case anything should happen, you would be able to copy your startup back to running and you're not going to have to rekey all that information in again. Trust me, you don't want to have to do that. We used IP addressing to enable devices. It's our primary way of locating devices so that our routers and switches know where things are. And in devices, like I've said before, can be your phone, your printers, your security cameras, uh, your smartphones, any handheld devices, your laptops, your PCs. And in this example, we're using IPv4. We have the IP address, it's subnet mask, and then it's default gateway. We also have keyed in its DNS servers and we'll get to all this information in future chapters. But let's just for now say this is tells our routers and switches where our devices are on the network. Our different interfaces and ports, here we have switches and each of these ports will have a IP address and it gets to these ports through different media. Here we have copper, fiber optic, and we have wireless. In order to give our devices names or IP addresses for the ports on our switches, we have to configure those. On this particular one, we're going to set up a VLAN and we tell it interface VLAN. Then we want to tell it what address and what subnet mask is associated with that. So we tell it IP address, here's the IP address, followed by a space, and then the subnet mask. Then you have to say no shutdown. What this does is it brings that interface up. To take an interface down, you type shut down. To reverse it, it is no shutdown. In order for an end device to communicate over the network, it must be configured correctly with the correct IP address. And that is located here. It has to have the correct subnet mask. 
that determines which group of IP addresses can talk to each other. And then you have your default gateway. That's which router is it going through. You can tell it to obtain the IP address automatically. That is fine for smaller networks, but I typically have ours set up to use the following IP address. That way I know exactly where that device is and what, where it's located. That is called a static IP address and it's manually configured in. If you manually configure one in that someone else has been assigned, it will tell you that there is a conflict. To verify that you have your information set up correctly and that everybody is talking, that is the ping command. You would ping the IP addresses and make sure that you have a reply back. Basically that's saying, yeah, I can hear you, you made it to me, here you go back. You can do the same thing on your switches and your routers. You can ping the switch and the switches can ping the end devices. Make sure that you have gone through and read all this information. Make sure that you complete your packet tracers and your lab assignments. If you have any questions, please let me know. Your Chapter 2 quiz is out there for you to take as often as you like to test your knowledge. And the Chapter 2 exam will be activated on Friday and you will have until the 23rd to get that completed.